All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to give it just a few minutes um, while people get situated. Um, thank you for coming today to today's Delete Me webinar on personal data's role in enterprise social engineering attacks. My name is Katya Wald. I'm the director of B2B marketing here at Delete Me. I'm also going to be your wizard behind the scene, um, hopefully clicking all the right buttons. Um, I will manage the chat and the Q&A. Um, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and I will monitor them. Um, I know Rachel and Rob will also take a look as well. Um, we're going to try to take most of the questions at the end, but I might pop in every now and then to uh, ask a question. Um, so again, welcome all. Um, I'm actually going to just pass it off to Rob for Rob to introduce himself. Um, so Rob, do you want to go ahead? Welcome everyone. I'm excited to have a chance to chat today with all of you. And I do mean, hopefully with all of you. So as, uh, as Katya and Rachel were saying, uh, we welcome questions, topics that you want us to cover. We, uh, Rachel and I, have a lot more fun when this is a conversation and it's interactive, but we are talking about something that I think is important, uh, which is not just the nature of social engineering attacks and what's changing about them and some of their root causes, but what the future may hold uh, with regards to trends here and new technologies. And we'll get into that in just a second, but I will most importantly introduce our guest speaker you for those of you who don't know me i'm rob chevelle i'm a co-founder of delete me and somebody as an entrepreneur that's been in in and around the business of online privacy for more than a decade now uh partly because it has taken a long time for online privacy technologies and services to play a bigger bigger role <clears throat> excuse me in uh in in combating the growing problems that we see out there uh so i do have a perspective that reaches back to before facebook was even a public company and i'm happy to share some of that with you but most importantly i'm joined by rachel uh our uh, keynote speaker if you will on this in this conversation rachel please uh introduce yourself yes <clears throat> thanks for having me rob and delete me um, I am super, super stoked to be here. Uh, I am the CEO of Social Proof Security. We're a social engineering prevention company. And I'm also chair of the board for the nonprofit WISP, Women in Security and Privacy. And we work to advance women to lead in the fields. And I'm super stoked to be here. Well, thanks for making the time. And in terms of what we want to talk about today, as I just mentioned, we want to talk about the way that social engineering and other attack vectors are changing and utilizing different kinds of information to construct ever increasingly sophisticated uh, attacks, impersonations, and other things, things that many of you who have joined us may be dealing with today or have to deal with, unfortunately, in the near future. And like I said, we want to make this a conversation, so let's try endeavor to do that. But first, let's take a look and start off with a video that demonstrates <clears throat> Rachel at work. So it's been three years since you last hacked me here yep. in Vegas, Rachel. Yep. You have stolen about two and a half thousand dollars worth of hotel points. A lot has changed. There's been a pandemic. There's a new president. I am still wearing the same shirt though, so. Oh yeah. You have put me in a middle seat. On a five hour flight. Oh my God. This time, I mean, as far as I know, you haven't broken into any of my accounts so far or anything like that. No, I'm about okay. to do that right now. Okay. Most people, when they log into their accounts, they reuse their passwords or they change it just ever so slightly. And when you do that, if you've been in a breach, which all of us have, that means I can take that password and I can shove that into all the other sites that you log into. I have been using 
quite a few of the same passwords over the years. I've gotten a bit better with right. some accounts. I guess we'll find out. Um, I'm going to go to a data breach repository site, right. and I'm going to put in your email address. You can see here that you're involved in 13 breaches just with this email address alone. Wow. Online, there are sites that collect all that breached information like email addresses and passwords, and it's likely some of your data is in there too. We have our first password that I found. Does that look familiar to you, Donny? Yeah, that's a password I still uh, use today occasionally. <laughs> okay, so you were using that on LinkedIn. Many times. Tip number one, don't use the same password for different services. Your password for your Gmail should be different to the password for your Instagram. If one of these services gets attacked and your password is leaked, hackers can use it to get into a different site if you're using that same password. The hackers got a lot of information, some of which included a hash. We also were able to crack one of your passwords. The other half is Evan. He's the other half of Social Proof Security. I want to bring him in here and show you what it looked like when he cracked your password. Evan emerges from the darkness. <laughs> Come hey, on in Evan. here, Evan. I can take all the passwords that we know about you, put it in a word list, and then try 10,000 different little tweaks that you'll probably try. I can add a number at the end, I can add a special character. And we did that for your password list, and we cracked one of your new passwords. Is this a password that you use now? Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I... <laughs> Tip number two, don't use very similar passwords across different websites if you don't want people like Evan being able to figure out your password. I guess you should probably go change my passwords. That's not great. It's not. So what are the tips for people not to be like me? Well, first and foremost, it is on the companies to avoid getting hacked and prevent breaches like this. Mm. Many companies do not use MFA internally, that second step when they're logging in. We need them to use that. MFA is multi-factor authentication, which is when they text you a code or whatever after you put in your password. Text you a code, you look at an app, you have a prompt on your phone, that's your second step. So if I get your password, I still can't log into your account because I don't have that code. Don't reuse your passwords. If you reuse your passwords across multiple sites, even for sites that you deem silly or kind of a throwaway site, I can take that password and I can use it against you. Mm -hmm. So you have to use long, random and unique passwords for every single site, I recommend storing it in a password manager, which keeps all of your passwords safe and encrypted and can generate good passwords for you. So Rachel, can you walk us through not just how something like that uh, is possible and indeed easy for you all to uh, to execute on, but how it's not just passwords, but additional information that can play into uh, these attack vectors and ultimately the kinds of social engineering that we're going to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. It's so much more than passwords. It's also things like your date of birth, your address, pretty much every address you've lived at, your phone number. And a lot of times people think, well, other than address, a lot of times people don't want that stuff out there, but they're like, what can you really do with a phone number? What can you do with the fact that my email address was leaked and associated with me? Well, data brokerage sites, if you Google yourself, you'll probably see them pop up. I do recommend everybody who's in this call today, go to Google, type in your full name, and then the word address, the word phone number, the words phone number, um, date of birth, and see what pops up. See if you can find interesting information about yourself. Um, you're welcome to throw in the chat. Uh, you probably don't want to talk about it, <laughs> but uh, it's pretty much available for everybody out there because these data brokerage sites are associating our personal information with leaked data or scraped data. And so it is likely for most people on this call today, unless you've used a service that can take that information down, like, of course, Delete Me, why, the reason why we're all here today, uh, you we're probably going to find that information about yourself on the internet. Two, data breaches and data breach repositories make it easy to associate that breach data with personal information that's visible about you online. And so the site like Dehashed, it's a useful site. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a useful site because we can see what's available about us online and the passwords and the 
email addresses and all the personal data that's been associated with us from a data breach. But you know who can also view that stuff? Attackers. And so we can see it on the good side, we can see it on the bad side. And when I'm hacking, I leverage that stuff to be able to gain access to your accounts. And then three, most companies use what we call KBA, knowledge-based authentication questions, to verify that you are who you say you are. So think back to the last time that you called up your health insurance company, your cable company. What questions did they ask you about yourself to verify that you were really you before you went ahead and changed the email on the account, the phone number on the account, changed your address or any other details that would allow for account takeover. It's very likely that they asked you for your date of birth, to say your phone number, which in many cases you can find online, say out your email address associated with the account. These visible pieces of information are easily accessible online and I can use it to convince companies that I am you and take over your accounts. Or I don't even need to convince them because these pieces of data are associated with you and I can use them to look up data breaches that you're involved in, no fault of your own, because the company was breached. And I'm able to look and find your password that was involved in that breach. And so many people, we know the majority of people from Google's research, I think it's like 52% of people, admit to reusing the same password on multiple sites. So for the majority of people, that means I don't even have to contact the company. I can just log in as you straight away. Uh, and so there's a lot for us to talk about today and to unpack, but those are the three main things, data brokerage sites, the breach repositories, and the companies that still use knowledge-based authentication to verify identity. That's why it's such a big deal. Yeah, and Rachel, I think one of the things about those three axes or repositories of information that can be used in these types of attacks that's interesting is the increasing ease with which people can connect those dots i think 10 or 15 years ago it was much harder for the average uh, hacker or somebody that simply wanted to uh, create problems through unwanted harassment or the like to be able to go from one repository of information and link that to the other so that you have this powerful way of saying, no, I really am this person, or no, I can really figure out with a high probability a way to get into one or more of their accounts and leverage that in an attack. Uh, now it's because we relied on the fact that only the identity of the person could really be able to piece these uh, different worlds together, these different pieces of information together. Now, uh, technology, unfortunately, has made it easy to connect a dark web uh, piece of data with a data broker piece of data with uh, a rainbow attack uh, machine and, and, and so forth and so on. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we kind of used to live in this world of security through obscurity, right? People couldn't find the information like you mentioned. And so because of that, People thought, oh, I'm safe because they only have one piece of, of info that they could use to hack me. They can't associate it with every other piece of data. Now, it's not so obscure. You know, you pay it's like five bucks to gain access to these data breaches sometimes. And a lot of times the attackers leak them for free online. And so it's it's not obscure anymore. And it's it's accessible. It's in many cases cheap or completely free to do. Yeah, and the scary thing, just like you said, is some of these attackers are not even motivated by a financial gain. They some of them simply are. Want, they simply want to do damage or they right. want peer recognition <clears throat> uh, or what have you. So we're not even dealing with economically logical adversaries in some cases. That's right. Some people, as they say, just want to see the world burn, right? And so they just want to they want to create havoc in places. Maybe they're motivated because they don't like that company and they want to leak details about it online. Maybe they're a hacktivist and they, they disagree with the policies. There's so many reasons, financial or otherwise, to be motivated to do these hacks. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, and believe me, we see that all the time on behalf of both our business customers and our uh, consumers. We see the exposure of their information, uh, not just through uh, coordinated hacks that threaten, 
you know, the corporate security of a network in a traditional sense, but also doxing and harassment uh, happening <clears throat> simply because <clears throat> there is some kind of strange personal motivation for uh, the exposure of that information. And, and, and that is a trend uh, that is unfortunate that we see increasing year on year. Yes, absolutely. The harassment piece cannot be overlooked because there are so many individuals that are being harassed by folks in their life or folks that they don't know. Um, people who are just hell bent on creating a painful experience for them online and in their real life. So yeah, these types of situations are not just a business risk, though they are a huge business risk. They're also a huge personal risk for people who are marginalized or being targeted for harassment. Um, and so while that might not be an issue, maybe in your personal life now, anyone who's involved in a business, anyone who's involved in a company wants people to be able to focus on their life in a peaceful, kind way and not be dealing with harassment online and in, in their personal life. And so it's it really is up to everyone to make sure that people know how to protect their personal data. And a lot of times, if you're running an organization, your teammates just might not realize how big of a deal it is for something like your phone number, your email address, your date of birth to be out there on these data brokerage sites. They just think it's what's, you know, who's going to come after little old me? They don't realize that it's actually a really big deal for most people. And I think something you said about it not being uh, anyone's fault that their information is on the dark web earlier is, is interesting to, to return to because in a way, yes, it's all of our responsibilities to uh, make better passwords as uh, your CNN uh, video showed and, and the rest of it. But at the end of the day, there are things that are beyond any individual's control that are trend lines here and that are, you know, like data breaches, largely out of the control of any single uh, person. And so we've wound up in a situation where it feels often to the individual, whether they're an employee at your organization or just uh, somebody in your family, it feels sometimes fruitless to start uh, trying to address this problem when so much information is out there and the surface area of that information, your personal information being exposed seems so large. And one of the reasons <clears throat> we stood up Delete Me and began to invest in Delete Me as a service was specifically to handle and help those individuals telling us, hey, this problem is too big and too time consuming for me to address. And just to throw some data out there, what we found, and it, and it backs into everything we've been talking about, we found that in, for our customers that, that I, I hope and we believe, although we, don't, we take as little personal information from them as we possibly can in order to perform the service, represent, are representative of the larger uh, US online audience. Uh, but we found that it, the amount of individual pieces of personal data, PII, that we found uh, on them in a typical uh, annual service has risen from uh, 255 data points to 491 in the last two years alone. So that's a 150% plus increase in just the granularity of the information that's exposed out there about any one of us. And that could mean uh, things that seem innocuous, but are, that are important for hacks like date of birth that Rachel mentioned, but it can also increasingly mean the names and ages and family relations of people in your direct family and around you, uh, mother's maiden names, children's names and ages, your vehicle data. So the sadly, the amount and the specific specificity of the types of personal data linked to you is doing nothing other than growing at a relentless pace. And that's why uh, getting on top of this and, and figuring out ways to both protect your accounts and to minimize the digital footprint that is ever present uh, for, for most of us out there 
is increasingly important. Uh, and <clears throat> that leads me to a question for you, Rachel, which is, given your work, what have you found that perhaps best expresses the state of privacy and the changes that are happening there uh, from, from your perspective, which is obviously different uh, than the one we have uh, going out and, 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 and simply looking and constantly monitoring and removing uh, this exposed information? Yeah, well, it's pretty fast for me to be able to find this stuff um, because it's like whack-a-mole. <clears throat> you know, the second you put in a request to Google to not index a specific info from this specific uh, data brokerage company, another company pops up with the same data because they all look at each other's data, they scrape it, they steal it, and then they put it behind another paywall or another free account cre creation. Um, and so for me, when I'm when I'm trying to hack somebody, the first thing that I do, and again, I'm, I'm an ethical hacker, so they're asking me to do this for them, right? Like Doni said, hey, what can you do? Um, as I say, I'm going to try and find everything I can about you online. I put their name into Google, just start with that. Um, and oftentimes I can find their date of birth, I can find their address and their phone number within a few minutes. Uh, and it's simple stuff, like these simple data brokerage sites. And a lot of times they're like, wait a minute, I thought I made a request to take that information down like six months ago. And they probably did, but the data brokerage site pops it right back up again. And that's why... I, one of the only services I've ever actually recommended by name is delete me because I use it. It's impossible for me to stay on top of everything that's popping up on these data brokerage sites. <clears throat> and oftentimes people will try and take it down and you can do it for free. Like I will never, I will never try and tell you that you can't do that. Google has a delisting tool, but it is such a pain in the rear to every single day go in there and find the new data brokerage site that's popping up your data and have to re request that it's removed um, because I'm able to find new things almost every day for people that are asking me to do this OSINT, this open source intelligence on them. Um, and people will often think like, oh, is this like dark web stuff we're talking about? No, this is the clear net. This is the regular internet that, that you and I are all using. Searching on Google, these data brokerage sites are not on the dark web. I mean, sure, there are things on the dark web that exist, uh, but I'm, in many cases, just finding stuff on the clear internet, the regular internet that we use every day, um, which is extremely frustrating. It's bothersome and it's dangerous because anybody can just take that information, pretend to be you to anybody else. Um, and our companies that we rely on, that we trust with our data, in many cases, they're not in a place yet with their human-based protocols to withstand these attacks that can be done. You know, they still ask for your date of birth, your address, your phone number, et cetera. So um, to boil it all down, I can find the information I need to be able to make the attack within a few minutes. Honestly, it's like about three to five minutes for each person. It's extremely frustrating. I mean, I want to work myself out of a job. I want, I want in five, 10 years to look back on my career as a hacker and think, wow, it was so easy back then. And wow, has my job changed? I can't do the things that I was able to do five, 10 years ago. That's the goal. Rachel, I think we both have that in common that we want to work our, our ourselves out of a job, but I, I'm not sure that I would forecast that to happen anytime soon. Can you walk us through a, a little bit uh, about how hackers are leveraging this personal data for attacks and if there's any creative and interesting uh, ways they're uh, they're changing uh, based on uh, based on your your experiences? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is, um, so data brokerage sites have all your personal data, like your phone number, your email addresses that you used, even the ones that you think are private. So a lot of times we'll create these like throwaway email addresses, sign up for services, then that service gets breached. And you're thinking it's never going to come back to me, but in your billing details, it's associated with you. And so now you have this kind of like secret alias maybe that you've created that's now associated with you in a public way that anyone can look up. So a big thing that's, I would say, gotten easier over the last few years for me is to be able to look at someone's leaked email addresses that I can find online associated with their address or their phone number. So I can take the address of the phone number that I find for this person on the data brokerage site. I go over to a data, rep data breach repository, maybe like Dhash, for instance. I go ahead and throw that person's address into Dhashed or their phone number, 
seemingly innocuous, maybe leaked. I, I don't feel that way, but some people are like, I don't care if the internet has my email address, but it becomes this huge deal because now this private account that maybe you didn't want to be associated with you publicly is, that could be dangerous uh, for people. And then secondly, um, now your password that you used for that, maybe it was a throwaway account. Maybe you felt like it wasn't a big deal at the time. So you, you reused a password. Well, let's say you reuse that password for your Venmo. And now I can get into your Venmo and steal the money that you have in there or request uh, money of your friends. Or maybe it's the same password that you use for your Instagram. And I can take over your Instagram and use it for annoying crypto scams. And this, you know, these accounts are things that people, they don't maybe don't realize how important are to them until they're gone. And they're like, man, I spent five years getting my dog's Instagram to have 15,000 followers. And now it's just gone and being used for crypto scams. How annoying, right? Um, so it can be incredibly disruptive. And, and that's, that's kind of like even a silly case. It can be scary when somebody's actually able to associate private details to you publicly. And anyone can do it. And it's not scrubbable. You can't just scrub the internet of this record. It's in all the data breach repositories. And it, it really can't fully be taken down, even if we want it to be. Yeah, it's interesting. I think some of the most effective social engineering attacks that uh, are seeing success out there rely on what I call sort of a two hop across social networks or social graphs. So your example on the consumer side, largely with Venmo, where somebody hacks into somebody's account and then has access to their friend's social graph and starts making what seem like legitimate requests, the same thing is, can be mirrored on the corporate side. If somebody hacks into somebody's, even a low level individual contributor employee's account, but then that uh, person can, has a uh, access to the network or the social graph, if you will, of that email, and all of a sudden, the people on the rece recipient end of that have this built-in uh, assumption of trust, and that's why these attacks can become very effective. Where before, you thought, well, no prince from Nigeria is asking is really has ten million dollars to to give me, so I can safely ignore this kind of stuff. That that's that, that's very unsophisticated and a long time ago. Now we're uh, moving into a world where a single chink in the armor can then necessitate a whole reevaluation of who somebody should trust <clears throat> and right. in what context they should be trusted. That brings me, yeah, that brings me to something that I was excited to talk to you about, um, which is the the new hire scams that we're seeing at companies all across the country. <clears throat> People often ask me, why are all of my employees within a week or two of starting at the company getting a text message from someone who pretends to be from the boss, their VP, their boss, like so, some executive at the company that they don't know yet, asking for gift cards? How is this all happening? Well, it's happening because the person is able to associate the change on LinkedIn. Okay, great. We know this person just started an XYZ company. And then they say, okay, who are the people that they could potentially report to? And they work in the marketing company or the marketing department. Who are some of the VPs there? Okay, let me look up that individual's uh, phone number, their email address. And I'm going to pretend to be them to that new hire. And they do that all through the data brokerage sites. So <clears throat> they look you up on LinkedIn find your personal email address or phone number. And then they look up your boss, find their email address and phone number. They text you from your boss. It shows up in your caller ID as your boss's name. You just started at the company. And a lot of folks don't have experience to know my VP is not going to be asking me for Apple or Amazon gift cards. So they fall for it and it, they just keep getting slammed with this obnoxious pretext over and over and over again. And they're like, how the heck is this possible? It's because of OSINT, open source intelligence, LinkedIn, the change to the data brokerage site where we find the contact details and the spoofing tools. That's it. And it happens over and over again at pretty much every company across the country and world. And it's annoying. It's one of those things that's just like, go away. <laughs> and they're like, how do we make this stop? And I'm like, you can't fully make it stop, but you can make it harder for the attackers to figure out 
who to spoof and who to pretend to be by delisting yourself, taking, taking that information down and a variety of other tools, which we can get into. For sure. And, and, and of course, gift cards, uh, while they're, they're useful for uh, cyber hackers because they provide some immediate uh, uh, money are really the canary in the coal mine uh, from a risk perspective if you have to deal with uh, a potential data breach, ransomware event, or something much more significant than handing out uh, some combination of $50 here and there. And that's what ultimately I think all of our uh, corporate customers are worried about, which is the big one. Uh, right. and, and, and when that happens, uh, there's no going back. Uh, there's no uh, paying for some gift cards. <laughs> exactly. You wish you could go back and just have that be like $350 worth of fraud rather than millions. Exactly. Um, when attackers find a company that they have an in with, that they you know have already compromised an account, it starts with things that are kind of innocuous, trying to gain some access, maybe exfiltrate some documents, see what we can do. Then, okay, great. Let me see if I can sell this access in the forum online. And now we've got a ransomware attack. Um, so that's exactly right. These things escalate. Um, they change over time. It moves very quickly. And we can watch these types of movements. I mean, it, this stuff isn't super private. It's happening on forums that we can watch uh, on the blue team or that we can study on the red team to see how we can keep uh, organizations safe. So yeah, it's it's spooky stuff. And a lot of times uh, it starts with something that seems simple, maybe not so big of a deal. And then from there, it can be a life altering or organization altering event. So Rachel, talk to us a little bit about the actions people can take here uh, to reduce some of these risks. Uh, because myself and our, our, our folks here have a perhaps a myopic perspective. We're relentlessly focused on our mission to help anyone anywhere with any privacy data request they might have. But beyond and above that, what can people do today? Sure. First thing I would recommend, I have three main things that I would recommend. First thing I would recommend is delisting yourself. So the first thing to start with is knowing what information is out there about you. Go to Google, sit down with a parent, a friend, a community member, go to Google, type in their name or your name, then the word address, phone number, uh, date of birth, family, and see what you can find on yourself. See what's available about uh, you online or them. And then understand how that could affect you. Your date of birth could be used to verify your identity with a health insurance company, which I could then, if I were targeting you, go ahead and change your health insurance, life-altering situation, right? Because health insurance companies still verify identity with name and date of birth. It's scary stuff, but there are a lot of things that people don't understand about the risk. And so educating on that risk is important first. You can delist yourself with Google's delisting tool, but you got to do it over and over and over again every single quarter, if not every single week. So if you have budget available, I do recommend Admind Delete Me, the reason why we're here today. If you are a company, I recommend thinking about providing Delete Me to your team members so that their information is not compromised, which leads to things like the spoofing text calls, emails, the way that the Twitter hackers hacked uh, Uber hackers, they start with a text message, oftentimes pretending to be IT support. How do they find that information? LinkedIn linked to a data brokerage site to find the information to spoof. That's how they're doing it. Number two, you've got to layer in your technical tools because you can try and whack-a-mole every single thing, but you have to layer like a Swiss cheese model. You've probably heard this related to the pandemic. Swiss cheese model, you don't want all the holes of the Swiss cheese to line up. So you want multiple levels of Swiss cheese on top of each other so you don't have a gap. So layering your technical tools like the right multi-factor authentication for your threat model so that if an attacker does steal your personal data, they can find it in a data brokerage site, associate it with a password easily in a data breach repository, and you have reused your password because you fall into the category of the majority of people who admit to doing that. Well, now you've used the right multi-factor authentication for your threat model and the attacker is going to need to convince you to hand over that multi-factor authentication code. Or if you have an elevated threat model, you use something like a passkey or a hardware security key, like a YubiKey. Now the attacker can't steal that unless they're sitting with you in person. And oftentimes we're not going to do that. 
Um, then you have things like your password manager so that you're not reusing your password. It's storing it safe for you encrypted. And you have good reporting tools for phishing so that your teammates can quickly understand and report to you. And the quicker and the faster you can respond as an organization, the safer your team's going to be. Now, number three, you've got to also layer in the human element tools. So we can't just do technical tools and we can't just train people. We need both together. Humans are fallible, they will make mistakes, and technical tools don't always work perfectly either. Um, and so your layering of human element tools are things like explaining the why behind your privacy and security recommendations to your team with security awareness training. If you just tell them you can't reuse your password, they're going to go, all right, that sounds obnoxious. I don't have a password manager. I can't memorize all this stuff. I don't get it. I'm moving on, right? You have to explain the why and you have to provide the tool. And then uh, you got to make sure that people know what to look for. So what does it look for look like when someone's pretending to be IT support, like they did in the Twitter hack, the Uber hack, uh, Twilio and Cloudflare pretending to be from my single sign-on provider? What are the common attack methods? What are the common pretexts, the attackers and who they're pretending to be? And what would it look like for my role? You know, if you're in IT support, they're going to pretend to be a customer. If you are in HR, they're going to pretend to be an employee. You have to understand all of the different mechanisms of the attack so that people can understand the why, the how, and the what, and the tools that you've implemented for them. Otherwise, they're just annoyed. They're like, that's not relevant for me. You're making my life more annoying uh, by having to log in and then put my password in twice and put the MFA in there. If they don't understand how it's actually protecting them, no one's going to want to do it and they will try and find workarounds. So it's essential to layer in all three of those, delisting yourself, your technical tools, and your human element education. Yeah, that's well said. And I think everybody involved in any of this, in a way, is battling the same enemy beyond the attackers, which is the laziness and ha habits of the general uh, population, and that's a tough one. Uh, it, it, explaining and educating is, is one thing, but uh, it, it's difficult for people to change their habits and habit, old habits die hard. And I think that's one of the reasons these attacks are effective in addition to all of the technologies that we've been um, talking about. Are, are there, you know, one, one more question on this, and which would be, are there any other <clears throat> things that you recommend? And specifically, do you rec are you recommending different approaches for different types of either customers you're working with or uh, the specific individuals within those customers? Uh, should different uh, people with different roles uh, take different precautions uh, or is it relatively homo uh, the, the three... Uh, recommendations you took us through, are they relatively, do they apply equally to all? Yeah, I guess I kind of think of it like a sliding scale based on your threat model. So a huge part of my work with my customers is sitting down with folks, listening to them about the threats they've encountered and the things that are keeping them up at night, and then saying, okay, how much access does this role have? All right, who has access to what within the role? And then talking through how to match the threat model to the tools and how serious we have to be with those tools usage. So um, yes, if you are on the higher end of a threat model, let's say you have admin access at work, you're the one who sends the millions of dollars, you, you, you send the wire transfer, right? Um, you're the person who's pressing okay to send the board deck that has sensitive financial details ahead of an acquisition. You're the one who's in charge of that, that extra special stuff. You have got to have uh, an elevated threat model in mind and you've got to you got to use your MFA that's going to be really hard for me to break into. So if you are on that end of the spectrum, you are being targeted, you, are, you have admin access, uh, you're being harassed online, you're the type of person who wants to be a little more locked down, I recommend something like a password manager. Um, you have to make sure that you are leveraging the right multi-factor authentication. So I would put you on the end with like a YubiKey or a passkey uh, rather than say uh, an app or SMS two-factor, which I could SIM swap you out of or attempt to siphon out and steal from you like what happened in the Twilio, Uber, and Twitter hack. Um, Cloudflare, by the way, was hacked the exact same way as Twilio in the same week. 
And the only reason why the attacker wasn't able to get all the way in is because they implemented that elevated threat model for those people and they had the right MFA. They had the hardware-based security key. Uh, and so three people gave up their password, kind of similar to Twilio, but they weren't able to get all the way in and get that access. So really making sure that you're matching your tools and the level of education to the threat model. So if you've got executives who have executive level protection, those are the people who definitely need to be delisting themselves. If you've got new hires, they need to understand at the very least that they're likely to receive these text messages that seem like they're coming from the boss, right? And not to send gift cards. You got to educate people in the right moment when it's relevant to them. And you got to layer in the technical tools for the essential folks that are definitely going to be targeted on a weekly, uh, if not daily basis. Um, and so for your folks, like when I'm advising the executives of a large tech company, um, which I'm not going to name, but if you look on my website, you can see some logos and you can make some interpretations of that to yourself. Those individuals are going to uh, be on the the highest alert, they're going to have their email protection tools all the way up, their spam filters are all the way up. They've got their password manager uh, locally on their machine with a long random unique password, the right MFA. Uh, they've delisted themselves. It's, it's just much harder for an attacker to target them. And that's what we want. I want this for everybody. But sometimes, of course, companies have to have to choose who they're going to focus on first. So start your admin act, start with your admin access group and then move to everybody and make sure everyone's equally protected. Got it. Let's talk a little bit about the future. We've already mentioned some of the trends that we're seeing just in the world of traditional data brokers and the growth uh, of PII that they're scraping, buying, uh, and putting up for sale to anyone. Uh, but, and we've talked, and, and I'll mention also that, and I, and I think I did, that we've seen a grow, uh, a trend that the types of information that they're able to collect uh, about each of us has broadened. Uh, it's not just name, cell phone number, address, past address, email anymore. It includes more and more uh, family and social graph information and increasingly location-based data. Right. and other data sets that are coming from those many activities that we go through every day to live our lives and don't think about. Uh, those data sets are up for sale or they're scrapable uh, or available somewhere else and aggregated into uh, the data broker's databases. So that's one set of trends that we observe every day while we're doing the work that we do. But what else uh, do you see out there in the future specifically around AI-based technologies and facial rec and, and other things of that sort? Yeah. Well, just like everybody on planet Earth right now, being excited about chat GPT and all that, stuff, all that type of stuff, um, they want to try and uh, optimize their, their attacks. So just like a person would on, on the good side, right? The folks on the bad side are going to try and optimize and automate a lot of their attack methods. And so um, something that I think we're already starting to see are, are um, phishing pretext recommendations being leveraged. You don't need a lot of skill set to type a prompt into chat GPT. Uh, something like, uh, let's say I want to write a, a, a phishing email that steals the GitHub password for an engineer at insert company name here. I'm looking to trick somebody uh, in level one support or an engineer or what have you, right? These types of things where previously you might have to have a little bit of experience or you might need to look uh, in a forum where an attacker is posting a script that they used in the past and you've got the script goodies who can repeat that stuff. I think we're going to see more variety coming from attack groups um, where they're able to maybe maybe they don't have the skills, maybe they're not comfortable doing a lot of these things or writing these pretexts or even placing these phone calls, but they can use bots and they can use AI to recommend pretexts to them, uh, to recommend how that hack might look. And I've tried this myself. Some of that stuff is legit, some is not. So I think some is going to work and they're going to need to to tailor their attack method uh, accordingly. But yeah, I'm definitely seeing that the attackers are getting more bold. A lot of the attackers are even younger than you might expect. Oftentimes they're minors, they're 
15, 16, 17 years old. So young, in fact, that they couldn't print the name of the Uber and, and Twitter hackers in, in, the, in the newspaper, right? Because they were minors. So folks are just going to, they're going to be able to leverage these tools just like us on the good side. And we have to be ready and prepared to understand what those attacks look like, keep the education uh, relevant for everybody within their roles so they know what it's going to look like, how to report it immediately, and spin up the team to react. Um, we are also seeing some automation with phone-based attacks where they're using certain tools to sound a little bit like that person, make a phone call, say, to their bank. Uh, we know a lot of attackers don't love getting on the phone because their voice is used and that can be used to identify them. Now we're seeing AI tools in use there. So that stuff I think is going to increase as the tools are more ubiquitous. Um, and I, I'm it's the type of thing that does keep me up at night because um, right now, we have some people who write phishing attacks and they're they're okay. They're pretty good. Sometimes they're pretty tricky, but a lot of times I'll look back at this stuff and think the right, the right training and the right technical tools could catch this stuff. And now with some of the AI recommendations coming through, they're more specific. They're more spear fishy. Um, so it's going to get more complicated. I mean, that's how it works, right? We just keep whack a mole as we go. Yeah, I think uh, the one way to look at it is the more sophisticated these uh, technologies can make the social engineering attacks, the more our audience and everyone they're responsible for has to worry about the basics. Because if the attacks get so sophisticated, it's impossible to tell who's impersonating who versus who's real. Uh, using AI and uh, voice and deep fakes of all, of all kinds that are on the cusp of uh, being accessible to anyone and everyone on the web in formats that are so easy to use, we couldn't um, perhaps imagine uh, uh, last year or the year before. As that future unfolds, it exposes all of us and all organizations to a set of risks that are only mitigated by getting your basics right. Right. So um, I, I just think it, it the, the future may be a more and more difficult place to discern what's what's real and what's fake. And as in such a world, it behooves all of us to uh, get those basics right in terms of uh, your layered defense, uh, who's being protected and what information is exposed and available out there. Thoughts? No, I think that's exactly right. A lot of times people expect me to say, like, as the attackers get more fancy in their attacks, shouldn't I have fancier and fancier tools? And yes, you want to make sure that you're using the right detection tools. But those things don't necessarily need to get fancier. They don't need maybe more bells and whistles. You just need to make sure that the tools work, they're implemented correctly, uh, and everybody has the baseline tools that they need. They're delisting themselves. They have the right MFA. They've got their password manager. Uh, and if you've got those things, you've got a way better chance than trying something that's super extraordinarily fancy that'll only work in a series of use cases when you're being super heavily targeted. So um, you got to get the basics down first. It's so important. One of the things that I think, and, and as we talk about the future and we talk about uh, the potential uh, weaponization of new technologies, uh, one of the things that I think is potentially a silver lining here is the growth in privacy laws and legislation aimed at these issues. And just like you mentioned that you can't take care of these issues through training alone and through technology defenses alone. I don't think we as a society can take care of these issues without a combination of law, process, and technology, right. all working together to, quote unquote, level the playing field that uh, we're all playing in today. That's really the result of 20 years of complete and utter uh, Wild West-based grow the internet without any preconditions, without any legislation and, and any constraints. And while as an entrepreneur, I uh, dislike legislation in general, uh, I do think having some 
rights around uh, both our personal data as individuals and the usage of uh, new technologies that can be weaponized to do these kinds of impersonation. We are seeing them uh, brought uh, at the state and federal levels and across different countries than the United States. And I think that those laws are going to uh, increase in their sophistication just as these attacks increase and allow uh, both uh, people responsible for training um, and, and for uh, dealing with these issues in a variety of ways to have some legal recourse uh, if, uh, if needed. And I think that's going to be an important and positive development over the next three to five years. Yeah. I know we're getting into Q&A soon. So before I'll say one last thing before you guys start putting your questions in the Q&A in the chat. I already see some. Um, as a hacker, I'm always skeptical about the laws that are coming out because I know so many of them are so strange and they don't totally understand hacking. What I have seen is that the privacy laws uh, are better. They're really pretty strict to protect our privacy. I am excited to see the privacy laws that are coming out. I hope that hacking laws uh, can get a little bit, uh, can elevate a little bit to match the uh, strength of some of the privacy laws without some of the riffraff. I, they just don't always understand exactly how hacking works. So I think folks in the audience today, if you're privacy individuals, keep really pushing to make sure that legislate legislators understand the nitty gritty when it comes to privacy um, and that they don't willy nilly just start making laws that don't make any sense. <laughs> um, because I, I really do think that layering in the legislation with the, the technical tools and the human based processes is the, is the best thing that we can do. Um, and I'm excited to see your questions now. All right, I'm back, folks. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions uh, that came in, and I'll just throw them out there to, for everyone um, about password managers. You know, is there one that's better than another? I mean, I know that there have been. This is my own commentary. Some some breaches within some of those recently as well. So is there, you know, is Google Password Generator and Storage somewhat okay? Are there any other services that are better? you know, is there any recommendations there? Yeah, there's a there's so many different password managers out there. Um, choosing a reputable one is really important. A lot of times people will say, oh, I just use like the password generator on Safari or Google Chrome. And I say, that is fine as long as uh, you keep your browser up to date. Your tool within your browser is only as safe as your browser is updated. Otherwise, there are known vulnerabilities that could be used to potentially gain access. I uh, I don't want to make you think that it's definite. Like if you don't keep it up to date, you're instantly going to be hacked or you're doomed. It's probably not the case, but it is important to keep that software up to date um, and your machine up to date. And then there's a lot of other password managers. 1Password, Bitwarden, Dashlane. I could keep going and naming a bunch. Um, there's there's a lot out there. So choose the one that feels right for you. If you're super, super politely paranoid and you want to go all the way, you can do a local key pass password manager. Um, that's what I would recommend for you if you were like uh, head of state, something like that. So uh, go for it. You choose how, how politely paranoid you want to be based on your threat model. That's great. Um, we had another question about sort of separating, you know, using, you know, being online for a professional capacity. You know, you want to be out there if you're looking for a job or, you're, you know, you're a little forward facing, but then also staying private. So do you have any, you know, I'll leave this to both recommendations to segment your lives in that way. Sure. This is something that I deal with every single day. Rob probably feels the same way. Um, I, I don't know if Rob, you do this, but I use social media constantly. I'm tweeting almost every day. I'm on Instagram. We've got all the social media covered. So I would be a huge hypocrite if I told you that you couldn't use social media in a safe, secure way in your private life and in your professional life. You can. You just have to be what I call politely paranoid, which basically means don't post anything that can be used against you by another person if they wanted to target you. Um, and so 
For instance, I would post, let's say I came back from a vacation. A week later, I might post that picture of the margarita with the beach picture in the background, but I'm not going to tag the hotel that I stayed at because now an attacker could go in, they could call as me and say, hey, I just want to make sure that I got the receipt and everything. I actually changed my email address. Can you go ahead and send that to me? And now my billing details are on there and sent to the attacker because they know who to contact as me. So there's little elements that you can choose to withhold from the public sphere while still using social media in a fun yet privacy conscious way. Like I wouldn't post what school my niece goes to because if someone calls me pretending to be from my niece's school, I can't be politely paranoid about that information. I'm going to take action. So instead of posting about that, I might post a picture of a cake that I gave to my niece, like something of that nature, more privacy focused. So yeah, you can use your social media however you want to, but based on your threat model, I would choose what makes sense for you and how privacy focused you want to be. That's great. All right. So this is a question. Um, someone says, I appreciate the comment that security, security via obscurity is not a good roadmap for success, but it causes me to wonder whether there have been attempts to do just that, flood various channels, sites, et cetera, with false data such that it obscures the legit data. I get wow. asked yeah, I pie in the sky, the but have you yeah. seen that? <laughs> I have seen people do stuff like that. Rob, you might have a better idea of the, the incident rate of people who are trying to flood with false data. Do you ever see people who are actually really committed to that? Uh, it's often talked about, and indeed we've we've played around with the construct uh, for Delete Me to, in a way, hack back at the data brokers by providing them synthetic data when we opt out uh, people of, out of their databases, because lo and behold, even when uh, we're processing removal requests, data brokers will sometimes say, well, we need more information about you in order to process that, which is the most hypocritical thing in the yeah. world, but it happens a lot. And so we do try to, in those kinds of instances, flood them with data that is not really uh, legitimately about our members, but I have not seen it done at scale, although it is an interesting idea. Yeah, I get asked it constantly. And I'm like, that's, I mean, you really got to be committed to the bit, right? Um, I think it's cool. I think it would be an interesting service to play around with. I think the perfect person to play around with, with it would be you guys. <laughs> so I'd be interested if you ever do research on the incident rate, the success rate of doing things like that. That would be really cool because yeah, poisoning the data is interesting and um, could potentially protect you. I know I've done that a couple of times, uh, but it's not something that I think I can focus on in my daily life without. Yeah, we, it, it's very interesting. And do ever ask, uh, please ask us again uh, as, as 2023 rolls on. We, we provide a service called Masked uh, Information or Masked PII, which allows you to generate these aliases for your phone uh, email and credit card. And that's one way of, of handing that power over to our members for them to do these experiments on their own. And I think it's, it like many to, new technologies and tools here, we have to understand how easy they are to use, how effective they are, and then experiment with them uh, to try to, fi try to figure out what works at scale. Yeah. I know we're at time. I could keep talking about this for the rest of my day. <laughs> We are at time. I know there's one more question. I'm actually going to copy and paste that and find JB and maybe have, have that question answered offline because I want to be respectful of everybody's time. But I also want to thank you both. This was super interesting, wonderful conversation. Um, hope everybody online got um, something out of it as well. I'm going to be sending out the recording to everybody. Um, so stay tuned for that. And we look forward to talking to you more at another time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. See you online. Thank you. Bye.